Hey, turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 12. We're back in there. And uh, to, today we are dealing with um, an interesting uh, topic. Um, it's dealing with the demonic. And you think, oh my goodness, what are you doing? <laughs> And uh, it's not a very popular thing to talk about, but it happens to be where we're at in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 12 here, what God is doing, and so uh, we're going to talk about it. Somebody asked me a little while ago, how come we don't teach on, on demons? And I said, well, it's not very fun, first of all. It's not something you pray about. Lord, I experienced that all this week so I can preach from the gut, you know. It's one of those things that you just kind of go, well, when we get to those points in Scripture... Uh, we will cover that because we want a biblical and balanced view of when it comes to the demonic world and Satan and his intentions and things like that. But he, here's the thing. Some Christians are so fixated on demons way, way too much. They look for a demon under every rock type of thing, a demon in this situation, and everything is, is there's a demonic influence and this, that, and the other, and they're fixated on those things. Here's what happens in their life, though. They get captivated by fear. They're always afraid of what the enemy's up to next. And they're never resting in this reality that Jesus has conquered our enemy. And, and that's what we need to get to. I'd rather be fixated on Jesus, who is Lord over all things, than the enemy and his shenanigans and what he's up to. I'd rather be fixated on what Jesus is doing now and in the future than what the enemy has done in the past or even presently. Here's your take home. Only through Jesus are people truly delivered. The Bible tells us worst case scenarios. People being demon possessed, that's pretty bad. Because then we can see that Jesus conquers it and he is greater than all those things. I've seen the demonic. I've seen demonic activity. I've seen how it strikes fear and it causes uh, destruction and the tearing down of what God wants. I, I've seen it. I, I've seen demons manifest it. But I've also seen the power of God. The power of God to seek and save that which was lost. The power of God to deliver and heal. And we rest in that reality. My Jesus is greater than anything the devil could do. So let's dive into this. We're in chapter 12, starting in verse 22. And we're going to talk a little bit about demons. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw. Let's we'll stop right there for a moment. Jesus faced a number of demon-possessed people already. Uh, we find in chapter 4, there was multitudes that brought some demon-possessed and he delivered them. Chapter 8, a man of a Gadarenes. And in chapter 9, there was another man. But each time Jesus delivered them, bringing that person back to wholeness and sanity. And when a demon-possessed person came to Jesus, they were never pushed away to say, ah, you know what, maybe another time. He healed every single one of them. But we think about this. What else does Jesus, uh, what does the Bible say about how Jesus dealt with the demon-possessed? Well, let me kind of sidetrack uh, uh, just for a brief moment and give you some, some clarity in this matter of, of what it is about. Uh, the Gospels point out about 12 times where Jesus delivered people from demons. Seven times where he spoke to them, where there were recorded words. The rest were just noted that he delivered them, uh, probably quickly, because that's who he is. And the times he did speak to demons, we've recognized two things. One, they knew who he was, and they spoke it out. Uh, Mark chapter 1, what have we to do with you, Jesus, the Son of God? They knew who he was. And they also knew their end time would be destruction and judgment. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus, God created, Matthew 25, hell for the devil and his angels. They knew their end. They know their end even today. Only one time did Jesus ask a demon's name. One time in scripture, he says, what is your name? And the man responded, the demon responded, legion, for we are many. Now, a legion was 5,000 Roman soldiers. That's pretty interesting. It shows us that a person could be possessed by, by more than one demon, and yet no matter how many, they're no match for Jesus. With a word, they all fled into pigs and into the sea and drowned. 
Mark chapter 9, there was one time where a man bought, brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus' disciples, and the disciples could not cast it out. Jesus then went and cast out the demon, and the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, what's the deal? Why couldn't we do this? And he says, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. In other words, he's recognizing this need to be prepared and ready before dealing with the demonic. It's not just, oh, we say these mantras, we do these things and sprinkle a little salt here and there and things happen. Uh, there is prayer and preparation and fasting when you're dealing with a demonic realm in that way. Why don't we see more demon-possessed people in our country? I would tell <laughs> we do. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> But I will say this, because our country does have some Judeo-Christian values at those foundations, because there is still a strong presence of Christianity in this country, it affects that culture, and I think it does have that influence being salt in the midst of a very decaying thing. If you go to places, uh, like you go into some places in Africa, and there are witch doctors, and there are uh, uh, tribal aspects of, 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 you know, voodoo and different things like that, you'll find very demonic things manifesting there. I've seen it in Asia. I've seen it there in places too. You find it in the jungles with all the shamans and all their, all their stuff going on sometimes. It's in pockets, different places all over the world, a little bit more intense uh, that we might recognize it. In the Bible, we do find this difference though that we have to be clear with. There is a difference between demonic possession and demon oppression. Understand that. And here's why. An unsaved person could be demon-possessed. You know what's scary is to see that people think the supernatural is so cool. They start delving into things because of the woo-woo things. They start working in those, those Ouija boards as kids because, ooh, we want to see what happens. And all these tarot cards and all these, you know, start getting engrossed in these demonic horror movies and things like that. And listen, here's the warning. If you don't know Christ, you are opening yourself up to a bad, bad, bad situation. The enemy is real. Anything overtly demonic should be avoided for sure, especially for believers. Uh, Psalms 97.10 says, you who love the Lord hate evil. But listen, a saved person um, cannot be demon-possessed. Understand why. Because the Spirit of God lives in you. When you accepted Christ, the Spirit of God comes into your life. He resides within you, and the, and the Holy Spirit doesn't timeshare with the devil. 1 John chapter 4, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. What kind of insecurity would breed in your life if you thought, well, is the Holy Spirit here, and then he leaves, and then he's gone, and then he's now here. What, what's going on? God wants you to rest in this reality that the blood of Christ has cleansed you and saved you, and you are his. You are in his hands. You are safe. The Holy Spirit resides within you. You don't have to worry about being demon-possessed. Look at chapter 12. Skip over down to verse 43, and four, four, 43 through 45. Jesus gave this uh, picture. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And he goes and takes with him seven other spirits <clears throat> more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first so shall it be with this wicked generation. What's he getting at here? He's not implying that a believer can be demon-possessed uh, by this illustration. He's saying to not have the person inhabited is actually a worse state. His point is this. Don't leave the house vacant. It's empty. It's swept. It's put in order. But the person needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There needs to be a residence there, the dwelling place of God. You see, there's a lot of self-help books out there. There's a lot of, you know, here's how to change your life. But the gospel will deal with the demonic. And the Holy Spirit wants to reside within the person's heart. Reformation and reorganization isn't the goal. It's repentance and regeneration. So while a believer cannot be demon-possessed, listen, a believer can be demonically oppressed. We see that happen in Scripture, spiritual attacks and spiritual oppression. Think about Job, following God, loving God, 
and, and the enemy attacks him, attacks his health, attacks his situation, his possessions, his family, depression. We see Peter at one point, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Called him Satan. Why? Because his reasoning was, was, uh, uh, was really demonic, that there would be some other way besides the cross that Christ was set on. Another time Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. What does that tell you? You have a target on you, believer. You have a target. The enemy is out to take you out. Recognize that reality. So when asked about, a demonic, uh, 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 about demonic activity in a person's life, at the foundation you start with this. Are they saved or are they not? If they're not saved, giddy up, gear up, pray up. There is an issue going on. If they are saved, then we need to run back to Jesus. We need to go back to his word, and we need to apply his word in our life and run to him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. We start applying the word of God to our life, knowing that at the name of Jesus, the enemy has to flee. Two things, back to verse 22, two things about this verse that we can recognize. One, we recognize that de demon possession exists, and often it does torture people physically. In this case, there was mute and blindness. Uh, we've seen lameness, deafness, dumbness, insanity, voices, even strength, unusual strength. Uh, in, Ma in Mark chapter 5, the man of Gadarenes lived among the tombs, pulled apart chains that were bound with, that he was bound with. Uh, that's incredible strength crying out and cutting themselves with stones. I mean, just that, that's happening. But not every physical infirmity we see is the result of demonic possession. Some people will get off and say, you know what, hey, there's a demon of cancer and the demon of, of dementia and the demon of heart disease and the demon of fungus, you know, whatever. And you go, really? Some things are just the result. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sin-stained world, and the health things happen, and things fall apart, and, and uh, we thank God that this isn't our end. But here's the reality, again, in the same verse, verse 22, is that Jesus has authority like any other one on the face of this earth. And at his word, all the principles, uh, principalities and powers, uh, they have must obey. Four lessons I'm going to give you this morning on dealing with the demonic. And the first is this, as we see. We understand that Jesus has authority over all demons. We have to understand that. They are not equal in God, in power. Satan is not God's equal. He's a created being. He's an angel, a fallen angel. They tremble at Jesus' name. They cower at Jesus' power. They shiver and tremble in their boots knowing their end. Verse 23, and all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Here's what I love about this. The crowd saw the miracle and they looked at the Messiah and said, is he the one that's going to deliver us? But here's what I love. They were focused on the deliverer, not the demon, not the method, not the man. Isn't that good for us to follow as well? And it really is lesson number two. We don't deny demonic activity exists, but we choose to focus on the one who delivers. That's where your focus has to be. Focus on him. And as you do, you're going to find yourself resting and rejoicing in Jesus rather than fearing the enemy. It was 1991, 92. It was at Bible College. There was a place up by Bible College in the mountains of uh, San Bernardino up there. It was in a place called Twin Peaks. There was actually a lot of satanic activity on this mountain. I'm not saying this to scare you or anything like that. Um, but one day, two buddies of mine, we decided to go out to this place called uh, Strawberry Peak. It overlooked the whole um, valley of Los Angeles you know, County and such. It was a beautiful place to be up there. You see this whole thing. We went up there to pray. And we got in his truck and we went up there and we're walking up this pathway up to this little kind of radio tower that we'd sit on top of the roof in and, and pray. We're walking up and we notice this is quite dark, darker than normal. This is kind of eerie dark. And so we walk up this pathway and we get up on top of, of this, this little platform there and we start just praying. It was actually an incredible prayer time, incredible prayer time. And we start hearing chains rattling. 
we start hearing all kinds of things going on, demonic activity. And yet we felt like, hey, there's this bubble around us and they can't touch us. The Lord is with us. And all these things are happening and, and, uh, and we're just sitting there resting in the Lord. We get done praying. We're really rejoicing. We come down. It's still really, really dark. Really, really dark. And we head back down this pitch dark road. We're going down. And all of a sudden we pass this, <clears throat> we pass this Pepsi can. And <laughs> about 10, 10 yards later, we hear it rolling after us. <laughs> I'm not trying to freak you out really dark and I look over to the side and I see these two red glowing eyes staring at us. The enemy wants to create fear. But we ended up walking down rejoicing because we knew our God is so much greater than that. And I am safe in his hand. I don't have to fear what the enemy wants me to uh, do. I just rest in the Lord and say, Jesus, you handle that. I'll never forget it. Well, I've had other occasions, but that's just the one that comes to mind. <laughs> Focus on the one who delivers. So the crowds were amazed, and the, the critics, though, began to, you might say, they got crazed looking at Jesus. Look at verse 24. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. Uh, it was a, go a pagan god at the time. It was a title that's attributed to Satan, and so a ruler of demons. And what did they do? They lied and they labeled Jesus in order to discredit him in the eyes of the people. I mean, what better way to get him canceled out than to spread a rumor that he is satanic? Because no Jew would ever want to follow that. So that's what they're trying to do. But look at verse 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He not only knows their thoughts, he knows their words, he knows their motives, he knows everything about it. And he uses this situation to teach them a lesson. And he said to them, verse 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? First, he brings up this principle. A house, a kingdom, a city will never stand if there is division uh, and devouring with, within. If one part is eating up the other, it becomes like a cancer and just devours the whole thing. Hey, listen, some of you have seen that in your own family. You've seen how factions and, and frictions and things have come in and divided up the family. We go, whoa, 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 what's going on? Why are these things happening? I'll tell you why they're happening. Because one, there's sin in the world, and sin creates selfishness and division, and it creates all kinds of problems. Two, there's an enemy that wants nothing better than to see your family destroyed. Why? Because God created family. And family is something that God created, and the enemy is against everything that God created. And so he wants to tear down your family. And so you recognize sin does a number and Satan can do a number in my family. Every kingdom, every city, every home. But secondly, he points out the logic in verse 26. It doesn't make sense for Satan to work against himself and pull apart his own kingdom. How does Satan benefit from what Jesus is doing if he's delivering Satan's captives? You see, Jesus is in a very tactful and wise way saying, you Pharisees are idiots. <laughs> you're becoming fools so he gave a principle he throws a logical and then he exposes the hypocritical verse 27 and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub by whom do your sons cast them out therefore they shall be your judges but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God surely the kingdom of God has come upon you Jesus was not the only one casting out demons. Well, there were people, God even used Jewish sons here to cast them out. Some were even endorsed by the Pharisees as they dealt with demonic things. There was, in Acts chapter 19, a group called the Seven Sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest who had this thing of casting out demons. And so Jesus, in a sense, says, listen, you're being hypocritical. You're accusing me, but your own... Uh, people do it as well. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> it says, Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. 
So how were they doing it? Well, they were doing it by the power of God. And so Jesus says, just put the dots together. If I'm working by the Spirit of God, there's only one conclusion to make, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. The Messiah would usher in God's kingdom and deliver people from darkness. Lesson number three is this. True deliverance from demonic possession comes only by the power of God. It's not a man-made thing. It's not an exorcism book. It's not a self-help ritual. Because it's a spiritual problem, only God can truly deliver. So it's best to go to him. So how does it work? How does deliverance work? Verse 29. He says there, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? So Jesus' actions were intentional, kind of a battle strategy. You've got to bind the strong man, in this case it would be Satan in the context, and take back what was held captive. Any, any, uh, uh, of course, you'd have to uh, uh, neutralize your threat first before taking the captives and rescuing them. And Jesus is so much stronger and in his in name the enemy submits. Often in prayer, you will find that we can stand on that authority in Jesus' name. We can, in a sense, bind the work of the enemy in Jesus' name. We have that authority because that's the power of, of Christ and prayer is a powerful weapon. We can see a person that's maybe held captive by sin, uh, by Satan, a prisoner, and, and only by God can these chains fall and they be delivered. Jesus, in the context here, obviously is talking about the demon-possessed man that could be delivered and saved by the power of Jesus' name. But lesson number four is this. Deliverance has a strategy for victory. You don't fight demons in your own strength. You don't go, yeah, put your dukes up. You're a goner, dude. You stand in the authority of Jesus. You recognize the power of Jesus' name and God's word. And you do the ministry <clears throat> by the power of the Holy Spirit, seeking to set the captives free. Verse 30, he says this, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. There's, there's no neutral ground when it comes to Jesus Christ. Recognize that. There's no neutral ground. He says you're either for me or against me. You're either with me, pulling them out of the darkness and into the kingdom of light, or Pharisees, you're against me. You're scattering them and pushing them away from the Messiah who came to save, to deliver. Continuing to talk about demonic activity, Jesus addresses a serious matter in verse 31 and 32 that these Pharisees were on the verge of. Therefore I say to you, he says, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. God offers forgiveness for every single one of us, but there is a sin that he will not forgive called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin. Some have said, what is that? You know, is that suicide or is it, you know, is it divorce? You know, people get in all kinds of weird things with it. But look at the context. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Pharisees who are attributing the, the person and the ministry of Jesus Christ as satanic. A absolute denial, a rejection of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. You see, the Holy Spirit, his primary purpose is to point men to Jesus. John chapter 14 tells us that they may be saved. That's the goal. But to reject the one that the Spirit points to for salvation, listen, there's no other way to be saved. That's just what the Bible says. It puts you in a bad place. Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven by which, which men must be saved. And the Pharisees were dangerously close to this place. And today you may hear people say things like, oh, those Christians, they're brainwashed. It's all false. Oh, it's just an emotional thing. It's demonic. You know, they're weird. They're, you know, they cast it aside. They end up acting just like the Pharisees are doing. The Bible tells us that if a man continually rejects the Holy Spirit speaking to his heart, convicting him of sin, 
if he continually rejects, 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 that there could come a day where God says, okay, I'll just set you in that way and you're done for destruction. That's a scary place to be. John Corson, he illustrated it this way. It says, during World War II, here's the illustration, a United States battleship, aircraft carrier, and several other small boats were patrolling the waters of the northern Atlantic in search of German U-boats. One evening, several pilots took off from the carrier and were told to be back by a certain hour. But the leader of the squadron of four planes purposely stayed out longer, feeling with just a little bit more time he could find the enemy and secure an impressive hit. As the sun set, a German armada uh, entered the area and the Americans were in trouble. Unbeknownst to the pilots, radio silence was ordered between the ships in the water and the aircraft still in flight. At this point, as their fuel was getting dangerously low, the pilots radioed to the American ships, but there was no reply. Again and again, the pilots said, turn on the lights, turn on the landing lights, but the lights didn't go on, for to have done so would have jeopardized the lives of thousands of men. In the end, the men on that aircraft carrier stood by in horror as they watched four American planes crash into the icy waters of the Atlantic. The Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. God has, a, has put a light, in a sense, in your heart to recognize the reality of Jesus and who he is. To reject that over and over and over again, oh, the commander-in-chief of all things, oh, he may go radio silent at some point. And all that's left is destruction. How do I know if I've committed that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It's really simple. Are you saved? Yeah, then you haven't committed it. That's simple. If you're not saved, you might as well get saved so you don't commit it. If you say, oh, I'll think about it, then let me warn you, if you stand before God, and you have not surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, it will testify against you that you have committed and rejected the work of God for your salvation in Jesus Christ. At that point, there is nothing but to face the judgment of God.